Next on our agenda, City of San Jose Environmental Sustainability Plan presentation. Carrie Gomenow, the Director of Environmental Services, is here. Good evening. Thank you. And I wasn't really planning on standing. I feel a little bit like I should sing, but, uh, but I won't. Because that would be, uh, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Might want to run fast. Carrie, um, Carrie, you could sit. We can find you a seat. It's okay. But, um, but thank you. Um, so good evening, I'm Carrie Romanow. I lead our environmental uh, services department. So we run the wastewater facility, solid waste, uh, legal dumping, uh, watershed protection, and the Office of Sustainability, and the Municipal Water, uh, water System as well. And uh, I'm joined today with uh, Aaron from ESD, Jared from PBCE, and Clinton being shy in the background. Clinton is our subject matter expert from PricewaterhouseCoopers who is really uh, kind of the thought leader behind, uh, behind this Climate Smart Plan. Um, you may recall that last year, Mayor Licardo and City Council uh, gave us direction to update the Green Vision. The Green Vision was about 10 years old, and uh, those 10 bold goals had uh, made significant progress, but it was time for, for a bit of a refresh. So uh, Council allocated us a bit of money. We did an RFP, and uh, we selected PricewaterhouseCoopers, and um, we had about $250,000 to do this project, and we are very appreciative that uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers did about equal as much, equal amount of work pro bono for us, so uh, including Clinton's time tonight. So uh, we're, we're very thankful for their partnership, and they are a San Jose-based company as well. Who has the... Me. Thank you. Okay. So... Um, so I'm just going to go over our, um, our program. If you have questions and you want to... Um, you don't have to wait till the end if you have a question, if, if I speak too quickly or uh, cover something too, uh, too broadly, please let me know. Um, if, we could go, uh, if we could go to the next slide. Um, one of the things that we've spent a lot of time with in this, uh, in this Climate Smart Plan is we want to change our culture and change our community so that we can prevent global climate change. So Council adopted the Paris Accord, so they said, hey, we should join the rest of the world and we should start to make significant movement along uh, reducing our carbon emissions. But, um, but we really can't do it the way we did the uh, Green Vision. So we can't, all the actions can't come out of City Hall. I mean, I'd like to say that we could solve global climate change with a couple thousand city employees, but that's really not feasible. So what we need to do is we need to engage the community. We need everyone to participate, and we need, City Hall needs to kind of enable that. So one of the ideas that PwC brought forward that we really like is the, the notion that if we take these environmental steps, we actually have a better life. So we don't, we're not going to ask the community as much to do things like recycle because you'll save the planet, but if you take some of the steps we're talking about, you'll be able to spend more time with your family, which research indicates makes people happier. You'll spend more time um, out in the community, which makes people happier. And you'll uh, have more free time to, uh, to do your hobbies and spend time together. So what this slide shows is kind of the, the Good Life 1.0. So we're going to move to Good Life 2.0. Good Life 1.0 was where you had a lot of stuff, and a lot of stuff that you didn't need. So if you look at the slide, that's, that's a lot of meat on that barbecue. There's like three people. And uh, as Clinton likes to remind me, there's two motors for that one boat. So, so a lot of time working, right, to fund all that stuff. But maybe it's not that stuff that makes you happy. So instead of just talking about the environment, talking about the choices we make and making choices that make ourselves happier and, by the way, also uh, help with global climate change. So, um, so these are kind of similar slides where you know you can't you can't really see what you have to do to create to to do uh, to make changes in the environment. But in general, um, you know, if you look at the middle right one with the recycling containers, and since ESD leads recycling, I can probably mock our own programs. It's really confusing what goes in the recycle bin and what doesn't. So how do we make that easier, and, and also how do we basically get people to think if you use less, that's better than knowing how to sort stuff. And, and then if you look at the middle left one, uh, that's meant to be like a Prius, and that sort of feels like, oh, to be environmentally uh, an environmental leader, you kind of have to have maybe a little bit of money, and it's a selective group. We really don't think that's the case, and we really don't think we can, we can spawn significant change if um, it's not inclusive for everyone. So, 
So when we look at the, at the Good Life 2.0, it's really being out in the community. It's maybe not having a, a giant house with two extra bedrooms that you use twice a year. And, and maybe if you didn't have to have that big a house, you had a smaller house that was a little more affordable, maybe you wouldn't have to work as, as much and you wouldn't have to heat your house as much, you wouldn't use as much energy, you wouldn't use as much water as well. Um, one of my favorites is kind of the uh, fifth from the fifth in where um, we talk about how people use fast, fast fashion, which you can tell I don't, uh, where you wear something once and you kind of uh, toss it aside. So the question I've been asking my neighbors, I also live in San Jose, is, you know, when's the last time you, you darned a sock? Like, I got a hole in it, and you actually fixed it. You didn't just go, oh, that's, I mean, hopefully you're putting that in the recycle bin. But uh, you're not uh, just kind of tossing it. So how do we sort of hang on to things longer and, um, and use them rather than just churn through things? Um, and, uh, and, and our goal would be to slow down a little bit more. So, um, so we held uh, nine community meetings. We met with 100 technical experts. We had 1,800 ideas submitted and 2,200 uh, survey responses. And uh, the wordle in that uh, the right side there is kind of the summation of what we heard from, from our community, that people wanted uh, time with people, they wanted security, they wanted health, uh, they didn't want free water, maybe they did, they wanted water. Uh, and they wanted to enjoy things. And so what we wanted to do was to ensure that we were building a plan that the community would actually participate in. So not just stuff that, you know, the, the techno nerds like me thought would be really super if we could do. So, um, so that's kind of what makes it different is, the, and we wanted to do something different. That, so that was intentional. We wanted it to be framed around the good life, so it's resident-centric approach. So the, the plan is called Climate Smart San Jose, a people-centered uh, people plan for a climate smart city. And so um, that's really important to us that the communities engage. And it's designed to inspire businesses, community groups, and families into action. To, um, and it's based on data. So it's all based on data and, um, and kind of the money part. Where do we get the biggest bang for our buck? So we went through thousands of actions. And, uh, and I'll share with you what we've distilled, uh, what we've distilled to the top. But it makes the um, the climate argument for broader citywide initiatives. So um, interestingly, if you have more jobs in the city, people commute less, and they're able to maybe not have a car. They're able to walk to work. They're able to spend time in city places rather than spending an hour or sounds like some of you had a harder commute today, an hour or so uh, in the in the car every day. So, so reducing our vehicle miles traveled is key to, uh, to meet our climate objectives. And, um, and we think that this plan, because San Jose is, is San Jose, we think that this is a model for uh, cities throughout the United States that are very similar to us. Um, we're not, you know, San Francisco where we're three square miles. We're, we're a big city with lots of, you know, 10, 15 villages within it. And, uh, and if we can make it work here, we think, uh, we think it's a good model for a lot of cities. So the pathway, pathway to Paris, recall, is, uh, is reducing our carbon emissions to less than 2 degrees Celsius, two degrees Celsius change. And, um, and our assumptions were that we would fully implement the general plan. So I'll share with you some of the data in terms of what else we have to do in, uh, in addition to the general plan. And as you know, we uh, have adopted and are launching San Jose Clean Energy. That will launch uh, in the spring to summer time frame where the city will be providing electric power for our, for our community and uh, we'll move our community to 100% renewable energy. That's one of the biggest moves we can make. And we'll create local jobs and housing built along the transit backbone, again very very much modeling the, uh, the general plan and uh, more densification and then more activation of residents, landlords and businesses in some of the additional work that we need to do. So there's the general plan, and then there's climate smart. So what, so what I'm focusing on is we assume the general plan happens. We're not making policy changes to that. We, we've kind of derived data from what the general plan will do uh, in terms of climate, and then said, what do we need to do extra? So there's a lot of things we need to do, it turns out. But uh, I won't read these to you. But, uh, but these are the general plan goals, and PwC had the uh, opportunity to read all of the general plan. 
And, uh, and our, the plan that we're putting forward um, activates 73% of the general plan's goals. So uh, very much in line with things the city's already doing, which is really important because we don't want to have conflicting policies. We want to be moving in, um, in the same direction. But as you can see from the data, the general plan doesn't get us far enough. So I always say the color's wrong, so I'm just going to look at my cheat sheet because uh, it's bad when I say the wrong colors. So, uh, so the yellow line is the current targets from the general plan. And then the green line is uh, what we need to do to get to Paris. The top line is uh, business as usual. If we don't implement the general plan and we continue on our current path, which you can see uh, not only does it meet state greenhouse gas requirements, but uh, it uh, moves us in a complete opposite direction that we need to, we need to be going. So. Um, so these are the, uh, the category areas that, um, that we're bringing forward to council in mid-February. Uh, we actually have the, the group of 100 experts that we worked with. Uh, I pressed send on the draft document right before I walked down here. And they're, uh, they're going to give us some feedback and uh, make sure we address everything uh, everyone thought we should address. And then, uh, and then we'll finalize the document and, uh, and share it with the council and the community. So the, the three big categories are a sustainable and climate smart city, a vibrant city of connected and focused growth, and an economically inclusive city of opportunity. It's really important that the climate initiatives include everyone. They're not just for the wealthy, they're not just for the middle class, and they're not just for the low income fraction, they're for everyone. So the nine goals that we have in there include transition to a renewable energy future, we're on our way to that with San Jose Clean Energy launch that can, that has the ability to move our community to 100% renewable energy. We'll also help uh, folks focus on installing solar and other renewable energies on their properties if they're interested. Uh, embrace our California climate. Go outside, plant native landscape, use less water, but, um, but enjoy the outdoors more than just being inside in air conditioning and, uh, and heat. Densify our city to accommodate our future neighbors. As you all know, we're adding 400,000 people in the next couple decades. We've got to have a place for them, and we have to have a place for them that supports our climate goals and creates the kind of city that we want to have. We have to create clean, personalized mobility choices. Not everyone's going to ride a bus. Not everyone's going to ride high-speed rail. Not everyone's going to ride BART. So there'll be automated cars. There, You could walk. We keep reminding people that's an option, that's a mobility option. You can walk, you can ride your bike, but lots of options that fit what our community is interested in. And we need to make our homes efficient and affordable for our families. So the more we can do to save water and energy, the lower we lower our monthly cost for all of our community. And we help prevent global climate change. We need um, integrated, accessible public transport infrastructure. So that's the high-speed rail, that's BART, that's you know, lots of things that we've been talking about. But we need to commit to some of those and we need to make sure that we're going to make them happen. We need to create more jobs in our city. We need to create more jobs in our city so people travel less <coughs> to work. And they need to be decent, inclusive jobs so people can afford to live here. Um, we also need to make commercial goods movement clean and more efficient. So the way your Amazon package gets to you, we need to do better than we're doing today. We need to make that a better process. But good, goods movement has a lot to do with, um, <clears throat> with uh, climate change. And we need to improve our commercial building stock. We need to get to zero net energy and others, uh, other issues, other options. So, um, so when you tie all those nine things together, they're color-coded and get to the goal we want to get to. So, um, so what the team did was they crunched numbers to how much will each of those actions, and we have a work plan for that, we have an action plan that goes with it. How, what, what do we get from each of those steps? And anything that was ridiculously expensive for what we would get, or something that the community really said they weren't interested in, we didn't make, didn't make the top list. So we really filtered the hey, can we actually do it? Will people do it? Are they interested? In, and um, is the ROI kind of there? So that gets us to, uh, to the magic number, but it means we need to reduce our emissions by 6.5% every year while those 400,000 people come in. So, uh, so it's not easy, but uh, if it was easy, we probably wouldn't be in this situation. So, um, 
So there's, these are the 53 measures that are in our work plan. So there's sort of three big buckets, and there's nine things that fit under those. And then there's uh, 53 things that we need, to, we need to do to get us there, focusing on energy, transport, land use, and, uh, and water. And so these are things that city staff are working on uh, on the objectives for. And so um, you guys have probably seen this, if for some of you that are in kind of the, the marketing product development world. Um, you know, we know not everyone's going to adopt everything on the first day, but think about how solar has really been um, embraced by our community. Ten years ago, if I would have looked down my street, nobody had solar panels. If I look down my street today, I might have to go in some people's backyards to see them, but if I look <clears> down <throat> my street, I'd say, you know, maybe 20% of the homes have, um, have some solar. That's a pretty big uptake given that people are making that investment themselves. So, um, so, so we accept that we need to help that adaption curve and we need to help move it more quickly. And so um, one of the things that we're going to do differently is look at this plan as a product and how do we help move the needle on some things rather than how do we create policies and do stuff. It's more, we need to be more of an enabler and more of a, a helper to get things going. So if we go to the next one. So the way that we do that is we, we start to think like, like a marketing firm. And we start to say, what do we have to do to get people going? And so uh, it probably won't be by sending you the postcards that I, tell, that I send you right now on when you can put your, uh, your holiday tree out and when your trash day moves. It won't be that kind of marketing. But it could be really cool things like Fixer Up for San Jose where we could, we could have maybe us to start out as a YouTube channel, but maybe we could, we could do better than that. But how do we start getting people to understand the what and the why and the how? And how do we make it easier and, uh, and a little bit cool? And how do we engage our, um, our, our local businesses and our neighborhood groups and others to, to start to help people <clears throat> embrace this as a good thing, not as, a, oh, the city's requiring me to do this really don't want to get into that mode. We want people to do it because it makes sense, which means we have to help find that space where, um, where it makes sense. And so uh, this is our summary graphic slide of those nine strategies that, uh, that get us to Paris. And these are things that you'll begin to hear from, uh, from city programs on a regular basis. And um, we'll start to talk when we make policy and we, uh, we bring things forward to council and to other commissions. We'll start, you'll start to see more of a connection. Hey, does this, is this support our, our pathway to Paris? Does this support Climate Smart San Jose? Or is it, <clears throat> or is it dilutive? And if it's dilutive, how are we making it up? So, um, so it's, a, it's a real, I think, interesting conversation for the next 20 plus years on um, how do we make San Jose an even better place to live and meet our climate objectives. <clears throat> That's just more of the same stuff. So, uh, yeah. So that that's kind of what I wanted to share. And uh, if you guys have any questions, Jared, we'd be happy to answer them. All. Just kidding. Mr. <laughs> <laughs> Hernandez. Um, I like what you were saying in spirit. It sounds great. Um, you know, we do live in a in an economy that is based on consumer, and you know. Um, being better than what your neighbor has, yep. bigger and better. Um, and I don't. I think that that's going to take some time to get us out of that mentality. Um, second, my second concern that I have is that I hear you talking about um, making our communities more dense, um, and I don't think you're going. I think one of the things that occurred is that the community doesn't trust the city when you, when you hear statements like that because there is a fear of gentrification, I know, in, in the east side. Um, and some of the recent um, occurrences where the medicine has really killed the patient. We're talking about adding more jobs, but, but you've got these construction projects that are so faulty and so underbid that where there was 300 businesses at the end of your project, there's only 200, so you've just eliminated a lot of jobs, which you know, and you, and you didn't do anything to prepare those businesses for it. So in, in your great scheme of plan, I don't see where you're planning for how you're going to address any of those issues. I, I mean, what are you guys planning to do so that your medicine doesn't kill 
the patient. Thank you for that question. Um, so we're working very closely with the housing department um, because we really feel that um, we're not looking to displace anyone and that is definitely a concern we hear, uh, we hear throughout the community whenever we talk about adding more um, and, and you know whether it's building more houses or um, building a high rise or uh, or uh, you know uh, t changing a, a business into something else. And so um, we're mindful of that and what we need to do is we need to make sure that we're not we're focused on um, not displacing people. So when we look at a project and we say we're going to add 400 rental units, we need to we need to make sure that we're not ignoring our policy goals in terms of inclusive housing. And so are there enough affordable units in there as well so that everyone is uh, is still able to live in San Jose? And those become part policy decisions, but if we don't have a place for everyone in the city, then um, then we can't, the businesses can't continue to thrive either. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure if it's a relevant example, but a friend of mine's daughter works at Safeway down here. And uh, apparently Safeway in San Francisco can't hire people. So they're paying for Lyft to take her from here to there every day. So she can, I mean, that, we don't want that for our city. We, and we want the small businesses to, to thrive as well. So it means as, as an organization, City Hall can't trim the programs that do that support. And that with, as we're looking at implementing the general plan, we need to make sure that we're looking at the people part of it, which is one of the reasons that when we named the plan, we wanted it to be a people-centered plan, that we're not just thinking um, just about the environment or just about vehicle miles traveled, but we're saying where does where does the individual fit into the conversation? So um, it's certainly not easy, and there's not a calculation that, uh, that I have that can say how we're going to do that. But as we're talking with, uh, with Jackie from Housing, we're, we're trying to be mindful that they're always in the conversation too, and that we're connecting uh, mobility plans and um, sustainability plans and energy plans um, with the housing and the um, the broader community in mind, and it's definitely going to be a challenge. Um, but we know that um, the the general plan is kind of our plan of record, but it's a lot of options on on how we implement it. And so um, you know we need people to keep keep asking us and keep um, be making sure we can demonstrate how this project is going to be inclusive, and uh, and that's going to be hard. Okay, you, you, thank you, but um, you might want to note that that is already happening. Mm -hmm. We have people who commute yeah. two, three hours from the Central Valley mm -hmm. to come work here in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. So what is happening in San Francisco is already happening. Well, I know that, and, and we, and, but we also have a, a large group of people from San Jose that commute to San Francisco or an hour and a half to Palo Alto or wherever. I mean, I think in general people are commuting longer than uh, we would like, and we have to get some of those transit options in place and get people out of their car. But the data shows that if we had more jobs in the city, it would alleviate some of that, and, um, and our jobs to housing ratio has to get better to help soften that. Um, and we have to have the right kind of housing for everybody. So it's, it's lots of pieces. It's not just jobs, and it's not just housing, and it's also where we put it. I mean, to have housing you know, way far away from transit does, doesn't help. It, it needs to be a, kind of a thought-out plan, and uh, and that's what makes it hard. Jared, did I miss anything? Uh, that's a, pretty good, I guess. I just mentioned that. Uh, yeah, the, the, um, one of the major strategies in the general plan is our, our focus growth strategy, and so that tries to balance in terms of where we focus our, our plan growth, you know, we're, we're projected to grow, uh, by 400,000 people over the time frame of this general plan and where we, we plan for that growth, but then also uh, uh, that strategy focuses the, that growth into specific growth areas while maintaining our existing uh, single-family neighborhoods. And then uh, the general plan also in includes, uh, as, as Carrie mentioned, uh, you know, a lot of strong policies on facilitation of affordable housing. So really uh, trying to balance that new growth and making sure that that um, a large number of those new units are, are in fact affordable and avoid uh, displacement and, and issues around gentrification. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Lee. 
Commissioner Martin and then Commissioner Semenik. Um, good evening, uh, Terry Martin with District uh, 9. I'm an architect and I absolutely love where you're going with this. It needs to happen. People in my area do not understand it at all as to what's happening. We have Cambrian Plaza that's getting ready to become an urban village right up against single family residences. And um, what I'm not seeing or not hearing is your kind of presentation when all the neighbors are pulled together. You know, so if they're having a big community meeting, you know, you need to be out there, housing needs to be out there saying, guys, we have to deal with this. Instead, it's kind of like the planning department's having to fight, you know, so I think that this is something that needs to happen, and it would really be helpful because we hear it, I can say it, but, you know, somebody representing San Jose goes, this is the urban village that was voted in as part of the general plan, you know, 10 years ago, and it is going to happen. Um, and so I think it would be really helpful. So it's just a suggestion. No, thank you for that. And that's part of the, that slide around the, the communication aspect that we really um, we need to spend a lot more energy on. Because if the community doesn't understand it, um, we can't. We may not even be hearing objections from people because they're just sort of don't think we don't think we don't care. But also, it may be scarier than it needs to be. But um, but yeah, I think to get, as long as we're working together, um, we'll we'll get there. We'll, we'll find the right thing for San Jose. Perfect. And the sidelight to that was kind of what you led into just at the end of this discussion was transportation and those urban villages being built around that. So ask the question which comes first, right? So I'm seeing an urban village, but yet I know there is no transportation in that location, right? And I don't see any plan. And so if it's a destination, anyhow, there, there's a piece that seems to be missing there. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of an awkward dance right now. John Snag, just before. Um, what kind of, uh, I hope we get PDFs of this, because there were slides 10 and 14 was a real eye chart. With PDF, we can blow them up, we can read them. Because I, I, I personally have a very interested in the chapters you had on page slide 10. I can. I yeah, can. PDF. Okay. Oh, PDF. Yeah. So we can enlarge them so that it doesn't need some addition. Um, slide 16, you know, I, kind of what he just finished saying, I think the engagement of the community is very important, and I don't see that here. And I would think that you would have them front and center on one of your networks. And if you need any lessons learned, talk to Jackie at housing, the rollout of bridge housing in August. A lot of lessons learned there. And, and I say that from the resident standpoint. The residents across San Jose feel shortchanged and they're very sheepish about the city just in general. So I can't emphasize that enough. No, no, and, and thank you for that. Yeah, we, uh, we definitely have, uh, have a lot of work to do. Um, we're, our, our idea now is to kind of get council feedback and, and have them adopt the plan and then, and then kind of say, okay, now let's... Um, go figure out how those things happen. Yeah, and I know your survey included the residents, and I know some yeah. residents did participate, and that's great. But I think it needs to be an yeah. ongoing channel. Yeah, we're, um, we, uh, so I should have, if I started with this, but we uh, we funded the plan through uh, money we won from pg &E. So we did a step up power down contest, we won a million and a quarter, and uh, we used that money for, uh, for this plan. And we're also using that money to hire a deputy director to lead this. And really, one of the charges of that deputy director is to go out and get money to do this stuff. Because we're not looking to um, not staff it, but we're also not looking to take money away from, from other things. And we, uh, we believe there's enough interest globally that, uh, that we can get some, some folks to come, to come help us. Um, and then certainly uh, help us uh, communicate with, uh, with the residents. Aaron Kinney. And we did hold 10 uh, public meetings in 2017 uh, about this and went out to the community, and, uh, but certainly it's something that we will do, be doing a lot more of yes. this coming year. Right, I understand. Yeah, could I just make a comment that fits in with what these guys are saying? I think what was good about your presentation, I carry, was the sort of the way it's integrated with everything in the city. It's not just an ESD project, it's got a little elements of here. And I think when we sit out in the real world and get presentations from various departments, a lot of times they are without any context of what the other people are doing. So I know there's an urban village out on the west side that's going in, but there is no transportation plan there. 
So how is all of that supposed to work without the transportation there? And if you're in a big public meeting and there's no one to even ask that question. So maybe you can sort of lead the charge and get this put together in a way where there's a uh, answer any question you might have thing. I realize that's Pollyannish, but I think a more integrated approach to what John is just saying, what Terry was saying, would really, really be helpful to answer people's questions. You know? Yeah, no, thank you. And, I, and as I'm standing here laughing about how we tend to, can tend to do things in silos, I'm really wishing I wouldn't have worn my department sweater. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we do need to kind of get us to, uh, this is one city plan, and, and this is how it feeds in. And one of the things we asked PwC to do was to read every applicable city plan, regulatory requirement that's out there, and harmonize all of it. So that, um, and the guy who did that is really tired. Um, and, and, and that way there's no conflict or no unknown conflict. So, so we kind of know where there might be a little bit of tension, but we didn't put anything forward that was in direct conflict with someone, but that will change, with something that that will change over time. And, and I do think that um, I need to work on, um, it. not every urban village is going to have in the next 10 or 20 years the right transportation. So maybe, uh, well, I need to focus a bit more on that mobility choice because there could be other other options around that. But yeah, definitely, uh, definitely appreciate that feedback. And we'll, we'll work on getting um, getting all of the city to, um, to figure out how we are all going to do this uh, in a way that makes sense. And, you know, certainly hearing from you guys helps us uh, realize where we need, to, we need to work on that. Let me throw out one more idea on that as we're coming up on budget season. And I'm not sure how it's going to work this year, but there's a meeting in most districts to go through the budget, which usually decays into something else. This would be a great little component to show some integrated approach to things, to show a future, to show a direction for people to move, to recruit volunteers like the anti litter, anti graffiti people. I mean, I think it might be a good opportunity, basically, to present everything as a single unified concept as opposed to the slap shot that we normally do. Yeah, yeah. That would be I just wanted to add something about uh, urban villages. And so the general plan. Uh, basically phases urban villages and some of you may be familiar with it where they're broken into what's called horizons but let's just call them the basic phases um, horizon one two and three and so the um, the horizon one urban villages are centered around areas where there currently is transit infrastructure so uh, if you look at the map of the urban villages you'll see most of the, the horizon one urban villages are located in the core area of the city and then our Horizon 2 urban villages are mainly around uh, fixed rail transit or light rail along Capitol and, the, and those lines and, and uh, bus rapid transit. Um, and so the, the general plan doesn't allow for residential growth in the, the later horizons. So those urban villages that are in uh, later horizons um, have to wait until those villages are moved um, to the, up to the current horizon which is considered um, during the general plan. There's a, uh, a four, what's called a four-year major review. There are some exceptions to that. Um, don't really want to get into the weeds on that signature project process um, and, and um, one other exception, but just wanted to, to, to uh, um, yeah, bring that to, to your attention that, that that has been thought of um, in the in terms of the urban village major strategy is, is contemplating the, the transit infrastructure. Take it off, Okay. Any other comments, questions? Thank you very much. Thanks. Fascinating. Thank you. I see it. Thank you, Ed. Do you have a public comment from Ed Rast? Yeah, but I have a question. It's part of it. You're welcome. I see your card. Please come to speak. I thought the presentation was very interesting, but also what happens is that a lot of times these plans are developed with little or no input from, from the neighborhoods or the public, and, they, and that, that results in the disaster that ha actually happened to bridge housing. And unfortunately, the city continues its, in some of these plans to basically go that same direction, which is not doing it in football to the public, but doing it behind closed doors coming to basically something that basically is, you know, a good group of people, but the communication from this group down to the to the neighborhoods has not exactly happened. 
And therefore, what's happened is you end up in a situation where people see another thing coming out of City Hall without real public input, and what happens is they get upset again because they've seen again and again and again these sort of things. And it, it would be behooving on the city administration to basically do more outreach before it goes to council for approval because that way they would be able to understand what the concerns are, what the challenges are, and what the input is. Thank you. Okay. Sabrina, uh, question. We have a, a former commissioner who's joined us. Is it appropriate for me to make an introduction or to recognize them? I don't know, I don't know what the protocol is. Uh, I don't know what the meeting rules are. I don't know. <laughs> for, okay. For that. Okay. I'll, I'll hold on. We are running out of time. <laughs> All right. Next one. Thank you very much for joining us. Next up. Yeah.